What's my obliquity for both of those obliques? How many degrees? 45 degrees, correct. Very good. So keep that in mind. Remember I said, make yourself a little chart before you take your test on those obliques because it's very easy to mix them up because when we're talking about AP oblique, now we're positioning the patient with their back against the IR in 45 degree obliques. It's going to be inverse to what we just talked about. We're talking about the two specific positions of LPO and RPO. And for those two, we are going to be looking at the side that is touching the IR. The lung that is elongated is the side that's actually down instead of the opposite that we just talked about. Therefore, when I say LPO, I have my patient AP on the IR. The left side is touching the IR. My left lung is elongated. For RPO, the right side is touching the IR. Now the right lung is elongated. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship on the LPO and RPO is based on the side that you're designating. Different from the REO and LEO because those are looking at the opposite lungs. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. How they're inverse? Like I said, that gets really easy to mix up. So I really suggest you make yourself a big square grid, make yourself a little chart, and map out what lung am I looking at specifically for each of those obliques. It's very easy to mix those up when you're going through a test and your brain's getting tired. Let's talk about the positioning. Still, like we said with everything else, guys, upright's gonna be your preferred medium. And why do we always perform uprights, preferably on chest x-rays? <laughs> because you always want to make sure there's no fluid levels in those lungs. Very, very, very common pathology. Top of your IR, still the same as what we talked about. One and a half to two inches above the vertebrae or shoulders. And then we're still doing a 45 degree oblique, just like we talked about the VA obliques that has not changed. Arms are still out of the field. Now, as we talk about arms, remember how I said when it comes to arm positioning, whatever lung that we are special uh, that we are focused on, whatever the star of the show is, that's the arm we want to move out of the way, correct? Mm -hmm. So if I'm in an RPO, which arm's above my head? What are we looking at in an right, RPO? The right. the right lung, so I want the right arm up out of the way, left arm behind the back. LPO, now the left lung is the star of the show. Left arm up, right arm behind the back. Remember, when it comes to arm positioning, whichever lung you are visualizing on those obliques, that's the arm that needs to be pulled out of the way above the head. To make sure that humerus is not overlapping that lung of interest. Now, we always, once again, mark the side that's down. So if I'm in an RPO, what marker am I gonna use? Right, because right, we're looking at the right lung and the right side's down. LPO, left marker. Now remember, for the um, PA obliques, even though we're looking at the opposite lung, we're looking at the upside, we're still marking that side down. So for an REO, still right marker, LAO, still left marker. No matter what you're doing with obliques, the side that is touching the IR is the marker that you will use. It's going to be very important because we need that to identify which oblique we're looking at when we look at a radiograph as well. It's going to help us out. Do keep that in mind. All right, so the CR is still going to be perpendicular, no angulation, and we're entering three inches below the jugular notch. Why am I going three inches below the jugular notch? I thought it was T7. Why would I go three inches below the jugular notch? Not a trick question. Because we're AP now, right? And three inches below the jugular notch is synonymous with T7. You know, when we're doing T7, we do this strategy, but from the front, we can go three inches below the jugular notch. That's still going to put us at the level of T7. It's an alternative way of finding T7. Big star on that. We always need to know that's the alternative to finding T7. And same as we've talked about with all our chest x-rays, guys, that exposure will always be made on the second full inspiration to make sure those lungs are fully inflated. Very, very important. So looking at this picture right here, what position is this guy in? What specific position? LPO. LPO because his left side is down and look remember with obliques we always center once again towards that upside no matter what oblique we're doing you're always going to center towards the up or elevated side what position is, is he in which position is he in on the table here that's not a cubit that's still not an oblique that's an RPO because the right side's down and the left side's up mm -hmm. RPO, so LPO and RPO. One is standing, and of course, one is recumbent. He really doesn't look human. I told you, he doesn't look like a real person, <laughs> does he? Looks like a mannequin. AI. 
It's a real person. I think his face is heavily photoshopped or something. It looks like a filter's on his face. <laughs> like one of those Snapchat filters or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Does it look real? Oh, yeah. Wait a minute, baby. He's like, oh, pretty. He needs a new haircut, too. It's just not Damn, fun. it's just yeah. getting yeah. today. <laughs> it's just really like Straight. old school. Yeah. Old cut bow, bow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what's our evaluation criteria for our AP oblique chest? Of course, like we said with everything, guys, evidence of proper collimation. Even though we're focused on one lung, we still want both lungs in their entirety. That's why we always center towards the upside to make sure we're not cutting the opposite lung off. Trachea needs to be filled with air. We achieve that by that deep second inspiration. Of course, markers. We must have our markers to know what we're looking at. And then we want the maximum area of the left lung on the LPO, because once again, LPO, left lung is the star of our show. Maximum area of the right lung on our RPO, because the RPO, our right lung, is the star of our show. I want to say, make sure you know what the star of your show is on your x-rays. That's very important to remember, especially when it comes to obliques, because they do change depending on which way we have the patient facing. So left lung on LPO, right lung on RPO because we're visualizing the sides that are down on those AP oblique chest x-rays. Do you have a question? So what do you mean by maximum area of left lung? That's just saying, basically, it's another way of saying we're focused on the left lung. That's what we're visualizing. Yeah, you're used to my humor. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. All right. So we are looking at an LPO chest. Now, how would I know it's an LPO? I know it's an oblique. I see a left marker. Remember, for AP obliques, we're looking at the side that is down. We also mark the side that's down. Therefore, left lung's elongated. There's a left marker that has to be an LPO. Does that make sense? because we look at the marker and what's the star of our show. Now, based on evaluation criteria though, look at this image very closely. Is this an acceptable x-ray to the radiologist? No. no. Why not? Because no lungs are cut. Very good, we are clipping off a portion of the lung right here. Now, I'm very, I'm actually kind of surprised this is in your book, because they, they would not send this image to a radiologist because there's actually quite a chunk missing on the lung there. And there may be pathology on that lung. You would not want to send this to the radiologist that would make you repeat this x-ray because we want the maximum area or all of both lungs to be on that radiograph. So same thing, that's the same image guide just showing you some more of that anatomy. Make sure you're familiar with it. Make sure you know your right versus left. Left lung's elongated in the LPO. Right lung is foreshortened. Whatever lung is elongated, the opposite lung is always what we call foreshortened, by the way. It's another term, another term that you want to write down. The opposite of elongated is foreshortened. So one lung will always be elongated in obliques. The opposite lung will always be foreshortened, which means it's a lot thinner. Now, some more things to make note of, guys. Of course, your trachea with that carina. Usually, you see the carina quite well in your obliques. A little bit harder to see on this one compared to the PA oblique, but we can make it out just barely. Your vertebral column in the middle, our heart shadow, left versus right lung. Diaphragm, which I want you guys to know has base once again. Right base versus left base. And of course, our costochreic angles. What are those little branches called? Hylar region. region. Very good, hylar region. Now, when it comes to doing these in <laughs> real life at the hospitals, these are actually very rare. They barely ever order oblique chests anymore. It's becoming more and more obsolete. Really the only time you'll see a, an oblique chest performed these days is with esophagrams, which is a fluoro study, because they like to turn the patient in obliques to better visualize the esophagus. So you won't do this so much in chest x-ray, like as a routine anymore, but on your fluoros, you'll do these quite often. 
But we'll still possibly do that in our test it's, lab. Oh yeah, test tell, yeah. Anything's possible on test tell. Why yeah. are they they just don't have a need for me. Like, I mean, the technology's advanced so much now that a plain PHS can pretty much show them everything they need to see. Yeah. Back in the older days, when it was like film, the quality was so much less clear. Sometimes they, had, they couldn't see the pathology very well, so they had to turn them into these obliques to get a better visualization of the particular lung. So they saw some little nodule on the right lung. They're like, I can't really make out the detail. Let's do an oblique so we can stretch it out more and get a better visual on it. But nowadays, the digital technology is so advanced. Like I said, just a regular PA and lateral chest. You pretty see everything you can see on that X-ray. Yeah, a lot of these positions are going more and more out of style, more obsolete as the technology advances. Yeah. Just want to clarify. So the AP, um, we're seeing the side that's closest to the IR. Correct. So if it's an LPO, then you want to see the left side. But in that picture, we're seeing more of the. So this is because they did not center well on this x-ray. You see how this is being cut off right here? If we look at the left side, the left side's still vastly more elongated or stretched out compared to this right side. See how it's much thinner? Because this side's foreshortened and this side's elongated. This is like a case of really bad centering. They should have centered more so towards the um, towards the left side to bring this over here. So that's a little bit of a little illusion. It's probably throwing you off. The left side's still much larger than the right side because we're stretching out that side that's down. So can you see it a little better? It does look like the right is the one they're focused on because they're centered bad on that x-ray. All right, AP chest. Now, why in the world would we ever do an AP chest? You want to wager a guess? How would you do an AP chest instead of a PA chest? If the patient can't stand up. If the patient cannot stand up, which is actually quite a bit of patients in the hospital because they're stuck in beds, right? So most of your AP chest will be done with portable x-rays, like the old portable machine in that room over there. So you guys are gonna get much nicer machines at the hospital. But when you do your portable chest, they will typically always be done as an AP because those patients cannot stand. Now is an AP ideal? No, it is not. The reason being an AP chest is actually gonna magnify the heart more because of the position of the heart. But of course, we gotta take patient care and patient comfort into consideration we're going to do this if there's no way that patient can stand or if we're doing those portable x-rays. Now when it comes to the position, typically they're going to be supine or seated upright in a wheelchair or stretcher. And once again, it's done when they're too ill to stand in non-ambulatory patients. But despite that, we're still going to do most of the positioning exactly the same as a chest. We're just going to use that different centering point we talked about. We're still going to put that IR one and a half to two inches above the shoulders, talking about the light. Make sure that you're centered correctly and that you have room for your marker. And you see in this picture right here, they gave this person a little pillow for the head. That is acceptable to do that, but be careful with that because this is a small sponge. Pillows are much bigger, right? Mm -hmm. If a pillow is large, you don't want it to be in the shoulders. You want to push that pillow up because that pillow will actually show up and might obscure the apices of the lungs. So be careful on that. Mr. Mannequin here, you know, he had a little special pillow. That's one of those uh, radiolucent sponges? That's a radiolucent sponge, yes. Cool. But those aren't readily available everywhere you go, unfortunately. They're very expensive, actually. It's about hundreds upon hundreds of dollars for even a small one like that. Yeah, yeah. medical equipment, they, they jacked up those prices. Even though um, it's probably made very cheaply. <laughs> I, so, would it be better to say recumbent supine or supine recumbent? Either way. Okay. All right, so before I go to the next slide, how are we, where are we centering for this x-ray, guys? Has anything changed? Where are we still centering? T7. T7, but for an AP, how would we find that? Three inches below that jugular notch, correct? Very good, very good. What's our SID still gonna be? 72. 72, now the only instance where you would not achieve 72 on an AP chest is if they're in an x-ray room like this on a table and your tube doesn't go high enough to achieve 72. That would be the only reason you would not achieve 72. But I want you to put a big star on this because I've said this before, you're gonna work with techs that do portal x-rays and they're gonna put that tube really close at 40 inches. That is not acceptable or optimal for a chest radiograph. You should always strive your best to achieve 72 to optimize that AP chest. 72, no matter what, no matter what, John, Bobby, Sue, Kelly, whoever says, 
They're telling you that's the best way to do a mobile x-ray. No, it's not. It's still 72 inches no matter what. You should be trying to achieve that. And they're gonna tell you otherwise. They say, oh, you just push, push it back in closer, push it closer, it's easier, it looks better. No, it does not. It always is optimized at 72, no matter what, on chest x-ray. So if the highest we can get is like 59? You're gonna try to get as much as you can, yeah. Would you notate that? Yes, you would. Okay. Yes, you would, cover your tracks. Like just like that room, correct? Because you try to get as far back as possible, but you can't. Correct. You maximize it as much as you possibly can. All right, so center MSP to the IR. If the patient condition permits, we want to flex those elbows, pronate the hands, and place the hands on the hips to once again try to draw the scapulae laterally out of the lung field. And that's not always going to be possible because you're going to go into an ICU room patient's going to be passed out on a respirator. Now, if the patient's passed out on a respirator, can you tell them to rotate their shoulders forward and put their hands on their hips? Mm -hmm. Probably not going to happen, right? You're not going to get a response. But if they're conscious and they're able to, try to go ahead and do that positioning. That's going to optimize your image once again. So we want those scapulae out at lung fill as much as possible. sitting in a chair like this, how is that going to reach up here? So sometimes if they put their weight on it, they can hold it up, but there may be a case where another tech might have to put a vest on and sit there and hold it for them, or a nurse, same thing. Okay. Yeah, but you have to get really creative sometimes, you know, to sometimes hold it for them. Yeah. Okay. A lot of times, at least in my experience, I've been able to have them lay back on it, and it tends to stay in place, putting their weight on there. I have a question yeah. related to that. Um, so if they're unable to roll their shoulders forward, do you angle the tube a little bit? You do or not. You do not no, that would actually give us a different type of exam we're about to talk about here in a minute. Okay. Yeah, you never angle that tube for your chest x-ray. It's actually going to distort the lungs. But like I said, there's actually another position we're going to talk about that we want to distort the lungs. Y'all probably know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all might? More dotted. More dotted, correct. All right, so CR, perpendicular central ray. We are going to be to the long axis of the sternum and center of the IR. Basically, that means that we are, sit, we are making sure that beam is lining up with the sternum. We don't want to be to the left or the right of the sternum. We want to be directly on the sternum to make sure we're centered to the body correctly. Now, even though they are poor, likely a portable patient in the worst condition, what are we still going to do, guys? Second full inspiration. Once again, this is every single chest x-ray you ever do, no matter what the position. You want that second full inspiration try to inflate those lungs as much as possible because these types of patients a lot of times they're in a much worse condition and they're gonna have a lot harder time holding their breath for you um, you still want to try to achieve that because um, what are we aiming to have at least 10 ribs in those lungs every time for full lung inflation Now typically, one thing you'll notice on a AP chest versus a PA is the clavicles will appear more horizontal with less curve on them. So that means by horizontal clavicle, that's just the way that the chest is laying in relation to a PA. PA chest clavicles have more curve. AP, they are more horizontal in shape. That's just showing you how they still move their scapula out the lung as much as possible, but not totally out dotted lines there. That patient has a slight pneumonia right there, in there. Both sides. Okay, what do we want to have on our AP chest for evaluation criteria? That should that should all be highlighted. It's not just tire. <laughs> Entire lung fills from the apices to the costal angles. So same thing, guys. We want all the lungs on the x-ray. You're going to see really sloppy bad techs in an AP chest with those angles cut off. That is not acceptable. Why? There may be pathology on those angles 
that we don't want to afford to miss because who's going to get in trouble? You're going to get in trouble if they find something later that you miss. Be thorough. Make sure all the lungs are on those x-rays. No rotation. They need to be flat on that IR. A lot of your patients in beds, you know, they're going to be getting bed sores. They're in a lot of pain. They're going to be wanting to shift their weight on you. Make sure they are nice and flat against that IR that they're not turning their hips. If you, you'll notice when you get to the hospital, you always turn their hips, try to shift their weight to get more comfortable on the bed. Make sure they're nice and flat because otherwise your clavicles will not be equidistant from each other and your, your, your lungs will end up being slightly obliqued. So we want a true AP to make sure everything's equal on both sides. Trachea needs to be visible in the midline. How do we make it visible? By that second deep inspiration. And equal distance from the vertebral column, vertebral column to the lateral board of the ribs on each side. This basically means we want to be nice and centered to our radiograph so that both sides of the ribs are on equal sides of that IR cassette. Nice and centered as much as possible. It's a little harder on portables because you have a free cassette. You're actually putting a free cassette behind the patient instead of sending them up against an actual bucky like you guys have been doing in lab. So that can be a little bit more difficult, but we always want to just do our walk around to make sure they're nice and centered, nice and flat, and they're as centered as possible considering their condition. I can't talk today. Excuse me. How's the coffee this morning? It's pretty good. It's Starbucks today. I ran out of the other coffees off. <laughs> It hasn't quite kicked in yet, though. I see. Mm -hmm. All right, so like I said, guys, a key characteristic of an AP chest, when you're looking at a radiograph, the way that you can tell an AP chest from a PA chest is if those clavicles lie more horizontally and obscure more the apices than a PA projection. So the clavicles will be a little bit higher and a little bit more straight across in a horizontal shape on an AP chest. Now, how much APC should be above the clavicles? About one inch, so they're barely above those clavicles. And there should be a faint image of the ribs and the thoracic vertebrae visible through the heart shadow. Now, it doesn't put, if you, I don't think it has it in your notes, but one thing to make note as well, on an AP chest, typically the heart will be more magnified because we'll create more OID in that position as opposed to a PA. And also, your pleural vascular markings, visible from the hilar regions, as it's a little webby, look at the things we talked about, little tree branches in the lungs. Hilar regions to the periphery of the lungs. But most importantly, that one in red there, guys, that's your big indication that you're looking at AP chest. So that's just that same picture right there, guys. So once again, on your PA chest, typically your clavicles are going to be about right here, where I'm running my fingers. On an AP chest, they're very close to the top of those apices, but not quite completely above them. It's just an inch above the clavicles. And those clavicles have a more horizontal shape, horizontal fashion, versus PA, they got more curve to them. It's a horizontal shape and very close to the tops, so close to the apices of those lungs. Now, when it comes to labeling these, another thing to keep note of, general rule in radiography is if the image does not have AP on there, you typically will assume a PHS because most of the time you're supposed to actually label it's AP. Because even though they give these indications of a horizontal shape of clavicle close to the apices, they're actually very, very close in the way they look. It's almost hard, it's almost impossible to distinguish the two if you have two high quality radiographs. So once again, therefore, if it's not marked as AP on an image, you assume PA chest. I would write that down. It's very important to remember. If it's not labeled as an AP, you're going to go ahead and assume it's a PA chest, unless it's indicated. When it comes to identifying a radiograph. Where is the label? Like, it'll be a, by the marker. It'll say AP chest, <laughs> typically. Or it'll say it in the question. Like digitally or? Probably, usually digitally, yeah. 
or once you get lines, it'll say it in the actual question, like label the AP chests, something like that. All right, so here's that other AP guys, our AP axial chests. Now, when you see the word axial, once again, it means we have some angulation going on, but one thing to keep in mind is we're actually not angling the tube, we're angling the patient. We're putting them in a lower, excuse me, lower dotic position. Write this down, I'm not sure it's in your book, but there's also an alternative name, it's called the Lindblom Method. Lindblom Method, I've seen them use that in questions. Lordonic position, Lens Blum method. Now, for this x ray in particular, we only do the Lindblum method upright. If they cannot stand, we actually have to do an alternative x ray, which I have at the very bottom there, we're going to talk about. They must be upright for a proper AP axial lordotic chest. Why? Yeah. Because we need the patient to get in a lordotic position. You cannot get in a lordotic position if you're lying down. It's not possible. Big star on this. We always want the patient one foot in front of the grid. We do not want them more than that. Otherwise, they're going to be too far back when they're leaning. And if they're not quite one foot, they're not going to be leaning far back enough at all. It has to be exactly one foot in front of the grid with the patient leaning back towards the IR. Also, little change here, guys. Make note of this. The IR is placed three inches above the shoulders versus the one and a half to two we've learned for everything else so far. So the Lord Dike is unique in that you're going three inches above the shoulders at the top of your lights. Now when you're sitting in your patient, whenever you're getting on the position, make sure you're assisting them to lean backward. Don't let them just fall backwards, especially mm -hmm. if poor grandma is standing up there, she's gonna fall flat on her back. Make sure you assist her very slowly to lean back on that IR and rest those shoulders. Make sure you assist her sitting back up as well when you're done. Now, write this in your notes. I'm not sure this is in your book either, but I've seen them ask this question. If the patient cannot stand, we're going to do an alternative view. It's called the AP semi-axial position. AP semi-axial position. They're going to be flat on their back, and we are going to add an angle to our tube of 10 to 15 degrees cephalic. That will achieve essentially the same thing as a lordotic position. It will stretch out those apices because the star of our show on the lordotic is our apices the lungs. That's why we do this x-ray. That's an alternative right there if the patient cannot stand. AP semi-axial. With a 10 to 15 degrees cephalic angulation of the tube. One step. One step. Shuffle. Always have them just clear do one step. Make sure you're not going like too far forward, just one step in front of your foot. And then okay, let me show you so I can y'all can see. And against the IR, I'll put this foot right at the tip of my left foot, and then second foot to match. That's one foot. And then lean back. Alright, we're still using a perpendicular central ray to the IR, and we're going to be entering at the mid-sternum, three to four inches below jugular notch. So very similar as for an AP, but you have a range of three to four inches on this one. Three to four inches, and we're still using the second full inspiration. Now there's a part of this picture I do not like. Where are they, where are they not doing this picture? Aside from this guy looking like a mannequin once again. What's wrong with this picture? His arms. The arms, right? What do we got to do with the arms? Yeah, On the hips and roll them forward, right? And why do we do that once again? To move his scapulae, scapulae out of the lung fills. It looks like they had him just like push up off the table he's on in the chair. <laughs> he was just tired of taking pictures. He was just <laughs> Regardless, make sure those hands are still on the hips with those shoulders rolled forward. And then one thing I see people always forget, if you did this in the x-ray, make sure that chin's up. That's another key part of that positioning. I see people mess up in the lab. Bring that chin up because they're going to be in the apices. The star of our show is the apices of the lungs. <clears throat> you might see anything else wrong with that picture. See how key 
keen your eyes are. Uh, his chin, <laughs> should his chin be tilted? The chin's up pretty good. Okay. Uh, Shoulders too much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Commission's okay. We're only looking at the eight C's. The shoulder people. Aside from that, who said SID? Are we at seventy-two? Yeah. Oh. That's more like forty. Mm -hmm. Make sure you write down that's still supposed to be seventy-two inches, guys. Mm -hmm. Seventy-two inches. That's a bad tech. That's a terrible tech. Yes. And they're in the textbook. The <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised they. I'm surprised that mistake's in the textbook. Yeah, it should be still seventy-two inches. Maybe they did that just to show the tube, I don't know, but come on, barrels, you should know better. Yeah. All right, so what do I keep saying? What's the star of our show for low dog? The apices. So what do we got to see? The entire apices and the appropriate portion of the lungs. Technically, we do not need to get down to the cost of printing angles, but most of the time we will go ahead and include that anyway because it's going to fit on a regular cassette. But... The star of our show is the apices. Therefore, we need to make sure the clavicles are above the apices. They should not be obscuring them. How do we achieve that? That's why we're having them lean back. That's angling the patient's chest to make sure the clavicles are projected above the apices. That's also how we can identify it on a radiograph, looking at the position of those clavicles. And I'll show you an example here in a second. It's also in your book. Still no rotation, we want them to be equidistant from the vertebral column, talking about the ends of those clavicles. They need to be nice and horizontal because we're gonna be in an AP position, therefore they're gonna look more horizontal. And the ribs should look slightly distorted with their anterior and posterior portions superimposed. That basically just means that the ribs are gonna look a little more stretched out on the x-ray. Because we're angling that chest. Anytime you angle a part of the body, it causes slight distortion. Is that how you spell AP? Right here? Mm -hmm. That's the plural. Yes. You add a C instead of an X. Yeah, it looks weird. It does look a little weird, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the plural spelling. Yes? So you know how um, Shepard said that it was that time for the uh, tape? So I was wondering, you know how uh, whenever we're measuring the C7 and T7, can we like use some tape and like mark it at T7? That way whenever we align the you. Tech's probably going to laugh at you. Mm -hmm. I'm saying for chest out tomorrow. Oh, for chest out? Yeah. I mean, I don't see no reason why you want that. I mean, unless the your fuckers don't want you to. I'm just saying because it's easier, you know, because we could just save this time. I mean, I, I would, I would ask him first, just to make sure he's okay with it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would say don't do that in clinic because you don't want to be sticking that on your patients and the techs are probably going to make fun of you if you do that. <laughs> just avoid it. You're going to learn to eyeball it though. Don't you? you know, I keep saying, I don't know if I've told you guys this, but you're going to develop a real superpower that you're going to develop x-ray vision. You'll be able to look at a person and see their whole skeleton through their skin. Like I look at each of you right now, I can see your skeletons. I can visualize it in my head. Because you're going to do so many, you're going to develop that actual vision and you just eyeball it without even doing palpation. It's going to come to you. But ask him if he's okay with it. It's fine. But I don't want to speak for him either. Wouldn't bother me, but you check the film first. Yes. What is uh, distor distortion again? So it's on the angle of part, it causes mm -hmm. the part to become slightly distorted. So this is what I'm talking about. These APCs are going to be slightly stretched out because I'm actually angling the patient backwards. I'm not in a nice straight up position. I'm angling back, therefore they look slightly stretched upward. And also the clavicles, like we talked about, see how they're above the apices? Mm -hmm. That's our clear indication. Put a star on that picture you're going to need to identify that on your test. When those clavicles are above those apices, that's a clear indication that that radiograph is a lower dotic chest. Lower dotic chest. And you'll see they did cut off the size of the lungs. Does that matter? For this one? It does not because one difference on this x-ray is the only thing that we're really concerned about are these apices. That's the star of our show. So we can afford to cut these off on the side because we probably already got a PHS prior to this x-ray. That's okay. You'll see how also the clavicles are more horizontal shape once again. You got less curve to them. That nice straight line, well, almost straight line. And what was the alternative name to Lordotic? What's the method name? Lindblom. 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 But just to show you an example, this 
particular, particular x-ray isn't done much either, because this is a really old picture. This is the same picture I learned from in 2008, but still copyrighted for 2023. Mm -hmm. Tells you how little they do these x-rays anymore. I've been seeing this x-ray for so many years now, I'm like, has anyone ever done another lordotic chest in their life? It's like the only picture you put in Google, it's the first picture you see, too, typically right there. Are those common? No, that's what I'm saying, they're not done much at all anymore. Very uncommon. Once again, because of the advancement in technology, with the digital systems, you can pretty much just get a good analysis of the APCs or so on regular AP or PA. You don't really need to do these anymore. How do um, textbooks and people like that or authors like source these images That's do they take question. the do they take the images themselves and they get them released or? actually i'm not sure about that That's a really good question i'm sure they i'm sure they get permissions from hospitals mm -hmm. to acquire images yeah must be a process like quite a process it would have to be probably to pay i don't know probably pay the patients off or hey we use your image in this textbook for people to learn from mm -hmm. All right, let's finish up with our special projections being our DeCubes. So for our DeCubes, we're always going to do either an AP or PA. It depends on patient comfort as well as what you want to visualize. Because when we do a DeCube, we're typically looking at fluid in the lungs or free air. So I say that. Let me give you guys a great question. If I'm looking for fluid on the right lung, which side would I have? down right. the right if i'm looking for fluid in the left lung what side would be down left. left if i'm looking for free air in the left lung which side would be down the right because the air the rises if i'm looking for free air in the right lung the left yeah. side's down because the air okay. rises to the right so make sure you write down when it comes to these two cubes am i looking for air or am i looking for fluid that's going to determine which two cube i do you typically have the option of AP versus PA. That really does not matter. It's just basically for the patient's comfort. But when we do the AP or PA projections for DCube, that's always a right or left lateral decubitus. When we're doing a lateral projection for DCube, that's going to be a ventral or a dorsal decubitus. Ventral means that the patient is on their belly. Dorsal means the patient is on their back, like this one on the right here. This is a dorsal decubitus. Over here on the left, this would be a right lateral decubitus or AP projection. Y'all see that? We do left lateral too. You can do left lateral too. It just depends on what you're visualizing. Which lung are we wanting to look at? And what are we looking for? Are we looking for air or are we looking for fluid? Is everyone's favorite one in lab? Mm -hmm. fluid? Or least favorite? It's not that bad. It's not that bad. It just requires more setup. Yeah. Okay. It's called a sideways chest. It's a sideways chest. You can hang the film sideways. It's going to get better. I mean, this is the first one. You're going to know how it works from now on. You'll be, you'll be in a routine. All right, all of our decubitus x rays are going to use a 14 by 17 cassette, no matter which one we are doing. 14 by 17 cassette. That's hope, guys. It's the end of the level. We're almost at the end of the PowerPoint. <laughs> it's a little foreshadowing for you. You know what? So they always have the centimeters. Um, I think in other countries they go with centimeters, but here in America we're just doing inches. Yeah. All right, patient position. So lateral decubitus on the right or left side. To demonstrate the fluid, like we just talked about, the patient should lie on that affected side. Very important to identify when you're doing a contextual type situational question. What are we looking for on this question? Look for those key words. Whatever that question is talking about with fluid or air, that's how you can determine which two we should do. What's the other one we always look for? That free air. For free air, the patient should be positioned on the unaffected side. So once again, for fluid, if it's in my right lung, right side down. If it's in my left lung, left side down. But for free air, if free air is in my left lung, I'll put the right side down. If air is in my right lung, I'm putting the left side down. Because what was that quote I told you? 
fluid falls and air right. rises. Great little quote to never forget there because they love to ask these questions on the registry about the cubes. They give you like a big, long paragraph situation. You gotta figure out which the cube would be the most effective. Now, I can tell you right now, I put this in red because it's important because they ask this question, but no one in reality is actually gonna do this because you, can't, you don't have the time to do this. But typically for a DQ, the patient should be in a position for at least five minutes to allow the fluid to settle or the air to rise. But I've never seen anyone do this and no one's ever had the time to do this. I've never done this and I can always see it just fine. But do make note that is considered per curriculum the correct way to do it. Yes? So how long, like, in reality would we allow the patient? I just put them on their side and take it right away. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. mm -hmm. Time is money. You gotta move. <laughs> So if, you call, if you walk up to your tech and client say, um, excuse me, we need to let them lay in their sign for five minutes first. And I'll say, no, get on my way. I don't have time for that. <laughs> don't ever walk to your tech and say, excuse me, but Meryl says um, five minutes on the sign first. <laughs> make sure to adjust my glasses when I do it. <laughs> yeah, make sure you adjust your glasses when you talk in a real nasally voice like that. That's, that's key. According to page 32 in chapter 3, <laughs> um, you're not using a 14 by 17 set. I'm joking, but I've had students do that. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> One thing you're going to find out in our career field is that a lot of techs have very fat egos. Um, and they don't want to be told how to do something. They think their way is the best way on earth, and they've just made up their own way. Keep in mind the bad habits, but remember the correct stuff. That's what's going to send you further in this career field. There's a lot of big egos in this, in this career field, trust me. Bless you. Okay. Now still guys, IR, same as our PAs or APs, one and a half to two inches above, let's just say above the shoulders, not beyond the shoulders. You're going beyond the shoulders to another dimension there. It's above the shoulders. Small typo, I'm sorry. Alright, so ideally, so you may not see a lot of people do this, but this is actually very ideal because the way that we're situated on the table, if we do not prop the body up, we'll actually risk cutting the lungs off on the side that is down. Therefore, we should always elevate the body two to three inches if lying on the affected side to help visualize both lungs. Because part of that criteria is even though we may be looking at the free air on the elevated side, we still want to see both lungs in their entirety, those two cubes. Like I said, once again, this is this would be incorrect with this picture. This would likely be cutting the right lung off. So we want to put some pillows or some sheets under that patient, or preferably a radiolucent sponge if we have it available to elevate that body to make sure both lungs are on that radiograph. Now, true lateral without rotation. Do your walk around on your patients in the lab before you do this, guys. Walk to the head and walk to the feet to make sure they're nice on their nice on their side, not oblique. You walk around before you make that exposure. Extend the arms over the head. Very important you get the uh, humerus out of the lung fills. And make sure, ensure, if you're doing AP or PA, that the anterior or posterior surface of the chest is against your cassettes. Another big mistake I see on these, excuse me, is that people leave OID between the cassette and the body. Make sure they're nice and firm against it. Another thing you can write down that really helps get you a true lateral, aside from the arms, is make sure the knees are bent. Bend the knees and put them on top of each other when they're in a lateral position. Now keep them in that nice true lateral position and keep them from shifting their weight on you. Does so it to increase stability? Yes, it helps keep them nice and still for you. It also naturally puts the body in a better lateral when you bend those knees. I didn't leave it, I packed it by accident because I was supposed to be moving today, but. <laughs> <laughs> Man, right. We just don't know who you are today. <laughs> yes. That line that goes to the uh, the imaginary nipple line, mm -hmm. that's MCP, right? Correct. But it isn't coronal like this way? Where, where are you asking again? I'm sorry. 
Sir. You're served right on the. No, that's one. That's, M that's M MSP, right? Yes. This is yes. Yeah. MSP, True. MCC. Okay. Yeah. And that's the imaginary nipple line? Or, yes. or it could be. That's the a way you can use. Well, don't, don't worry about the nipple line. That's more, more, that's more so for uh, serving your crosshair. That's not really going to relate to your MCP versus your MSP. Yeah, don't, um, don't let that mess you up. Now, I'm sure Mr. Fong showed you guys as well. Typically, if you put the top of your light in the axilla or the armpits, it's another good way to make sure you're centered well in that chest x ray. All right, so horizontal central ray still, guys. Horizontal and perpendicular. I want you all to put three big stars on the word horizontal. Because once again, when you see the word horizontal in a question, horizontal central ray always indicates we're doing a decubitus x ray. Or, as we'll learn with the extremities, a cross table x ray. But for now, any of your decubes will always have the word horizontal in the question. Horizontal central ray. One of those big key words you want to look out for. Now for AP, same thing guys. We're gonna go three inches below the jugular notch for centering. For PA, we're gonna use T7, just like everything else. And we're still gonna make that exposure on the second full inspiration to fully inflate those lungs. So this is for our AP and PA lateral DQs. Not our dorsal and ventral, we're gonna get to those next. So what do we got to see for our evaluation criteria? Still, guys, that evidence of proper collimation if needed. The affected side in its entirety from apex to costophrenic angle. But I will say, add to your notes, you still want to see both lungs in their entirety for an optimized acutus x-ray. So it says affected, but make sure you make note both lungs should be completely visible from apex to costophrenic angles. No rotation. Make sure their back is nice and flat against the IR or their chest, depending if you're doing the AP versus PA. Also, make note, the arms need not be visible in the field of interest. It can be very hard to bring those arms all the way up above the head. I'm sure they are because some of that arm tissue or the humerus will end up covering up those lungs. You want to make sure they're nice and fully out of the way before you take that x-ray. And then like the other ones we talked about, that faintly visible spine, pulmonary vascular markings, which is talking about your hyalur regions, it's the periphery of the lungs. Very similar evaluation criteria from what we talked about before. So make sure you add to your notes both lungs in their entirety, apex to cusphrenic angle. I have yes. One question. On um, yeah. like your MSP and MCP, when you're looking at it, are you always looking at this line to see where it is centered? You, you get what I'm saying? I do, so it's always this line you're looking at, or are you looking at this line? I'll well, say for the DQs, you don't need to really worry about those. It's just going to confuse you. Well, like either, like when you're looking at a mm -hmm. chest, yeah. Do you always look at this line? It means both. Yeah, you want to, because one's going to always be perpendicular, one's going to be parallel. Okay. For example, in a D cube, your MCP is perpendicular to the table, okay. while your MSP is parallel to the wall or the cassette. Don't worry, it's going to confuse you. Don't worry about that. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to picture it. They have a point. They have center points. All right, so what did I say, guys? It's sideways chest x ray. So, guess how we hang them into the radiologist? Sideways. That's actually how we're going to send it to the actual radiologist. That's not a mistake. It's supposed to look that way. Because we're demonstrating either fluid, free air, or both on the x ray. Down here would be the fluid. Y'all see it? See all this white right here? The lung should be all the way out here, but there's a bunch of fluid on the right surface of that lung. No free air on this x-ray. You're saying, well, what about that? That's actually air in the stomach. That's normal. It's almost always air in the stomach for most of your patients. But look at this x-ray. Can you identify what specific DQ we did? What is that? Right lateral Q. Why? Because the right's down, you get a nice marker saying the left side's up. So it's a right lateral DQ. 
Always look to the side that is down. That's how you can identify which specific routine you're doing. Right lateral versus left lateral. Yes. If we didn't have that marker, like for test purposes or whatever, could we use the stomach to help us identify? You could, but you know, you can turn your head sideways. Can you still tell your right side's down, your left side's up? Yeah. And fluid is always white. Huh? Is the what white? The fluid. At the fluid will always look white. Yes, okay. the fluid always looks very white on an x ray, and air will always look black. Good question. We can still see in most of our anatomy, guys, it's just sideways chest x ray. We still have apices. We have costophrenic angles. We have hilar region, heart shadow, air filled trachea. You'll still see all that? You know it's sideways? Yeah. That has not changed. It's still the same anatomy. We're just looking at it from a different direction. So if you got to turn your head sideways in your test, that's okay. I'm not gonna say are you cheating over there. <laughs> I understand. Where would the cranium be? In the head? No, the sorry. The carina. Oh the carina. Carina, we can't really see, but it's gonna be about right here. Carina, most of the time you're gonna see on your obliques. Yeah. There's another example. Yes. So in this kind of pictures, uh radiographic picture, it's always the opposite, right? Because if we're laying like this, we're actually laying on the left side. This is a right. This, this picture is lying right on right. your right side. So it's a right lateral VQ because the right side is down. The left side is up. Whatever side is down is how we label the actual position. So right side down, right lateral. The head is right here, right? Hmm? So on the left? Head yeah. on the left or right? Head's right here. Okay. So you're laying like this. Like yeah, they were, they'd they're be facing, facing us. They're facing, they're facing us. Yes. 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 Like okay. looking at you. Yeah, but their chin is raised a little bit because they need to see the trachea. Mm -hmm. so there's a, there's an opposite. So there's an opposite. Their chin was down. Yeah. Yeah. So this would be a left lateral because now the left side's down and yeah, the right the side's up. Here. Heads up here. This one is giving us an example of free air. That's what your free air is going to look like. See that nice straight oh, line, that dark shadow? Okay. That's the free air that we're looking at. Ooh. Now, based on the criteria, is this x-ray acceptable? Mm -hmm. Why not? Cuts off the lungs. The left side. We're cutting off the left lung, yeah. So what did, what did they not do on this x-ray? They didn't probably on something. Correct. And this is a, this is a child, this is a pediatric. Mm -hmm. Can you tell because of the grouping of all the ribs? Like how You're less developed, yes. Yes. <clears throat> okay, the last two positions, guys, I promise. We're almost done. We have our lateral, ventral, or dorsal decubitus positions. When I say ventral, how's the patient lying? On their stomach. On their stomach, dorsal they're lying on their back. back. We're still doing a horizontal beam across the table. So position will always be prone or supine, depending on what we want to visualize. We're still elevating the body two, three inches to make sure we're not cutting anything off. So we're putting those pillows and those sheets underneath their back or their belly. A little bit different. Top of the IR for the decubes on these will be at the level of the thyroid cartilage. So approximately about C4. Same thing, patient needs to be in that position about five minutes to allow the fluid to settle or air to rise. Because we're still visualizing fluid and or air on these positions. Now when it comes to positioning, they need to be in a true prone or supine position without the rotation. The affected side should be against the IR. So if we're concerned about the left lung, put their left side against the IR. Right lung, right side against the IR. And arm should still be above the head to ensure those humerus are out of those lung apices. Out of those lung fills. All right, so key word again, guys, horizontal central ray means I'm doing a D cube x-ray. I'm shooting across the table. It's still perpendicular. We're going to be three to four inches below the jugular notch for a dorsal decubus and T7 once again for a ventral decubus. So for the dorsal, we're using the jugular notch method. For ventral, 
we're using the T7 method. And we're still going to make that exposure on the second full inspiration. Since you're also going to line up that crosshair with the patient's MCP. It's not your nose, but you can add that as well. Just like you would for a regular lateral chest x ray. You're just lying down. Um, are these ones as nice called either because they're. Yeah, I've never done a ventral okay. dorsal acute. It's super rare. But the, deep, the regular DQ is left lateral and right lateral. We do those all the time. Mm -hmm. So same thing, guys, it should sound very familiar. It's that same evaluation criteria, evidence of proper collimation, the entire lung fields from apices to cuspering angles, including the anterior and posterior surfaces. Very important because we have to make sure we elevate the body, make sure we're not chopping off the front or back of the lungs. Upper field of the lungs should not be obscured by the arms. We have to make sure those arms are nice and out of the way. No rotation achieved from a true lateral. And T7 at the center of our IR. Once again, we got to prop the patient up to make sure they're at the nice center point of that cassette. And then those highlighter regions should be visible as well, those vascular markings. Yes, question? So, well, when you say evaluation, is that what we actually need to check? So when we say evaluation, this is what the radiograph needs to demonstrate before we send it to the doctor. It's called evaluation criteria. Just that we need to, as, an, as a technologist, we must check all these Correct. Things. So you're going to take your x-ray, it comes up on your computer screen, you should be running through all this in your mind. Do I have all the criteria to send this to the radiologist? Yes. And right now it seems like a lot, but you're just going to be able to glance at images and know if it fits or not. You're just going to know if it's optimal or not. It's going to come to you. Okay, y'all's brains fried yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're almost at the end of this chapter, I promise. I'm gonna keep saying that, we're almost there. I thought this was like chapter what? This is one chapter. No, I know, but I thought it was uh, like four chapters. Oh, yeah. They're very big chapters. So wait till we get to upper and lower extremities next semester. Whew. <laughs> There's a lot more to come. We're not even like done with the axial skeleton yet, huh? No. And there's an example of a dorsal decubitus. How do we know that's dorsal, guys? Because the back of the patient is on the bottom of that film. We still hang it on its side just like this. Anterior surface is up. Posterior surface is down. Therefore, it is a dorsal decubitus. And this is showing us fluid once again. Because fluid falls, air rises. This little straight line. Fluid is always indicated by a nice straight line because it falls with gravity the bottom of the patient, out of the line. All right, so a few um, image critique practice images here, guys, and then we will take a break and do our test review. These are the last few slides here. So first question, review question. This exam is performed to demonstrate all the following except what? Which one does not fit? B. I think most people say B. Do we all agree with B? You're correct that it is B because we do. What is this, by the way? First of all, what is this exam? Okay. Airway. Airway. AP upper airway, right? Mm -hmm. AP upper airway. We do look for foreign bodies. That's the main reason we do it. We also do look for swelling and masses. But odontoid displacement, well, we've got to know what an odontoid is, first of all. It's found on the C2 vertebrae. That has its own separate exam. Can we even see C2 on this x ray? No. We cannot. So write that down. No, we haven't had that yet, but the word odontoid refers to the dens. The odontoid process is found in C2. And we're not even concerned with C2 at all on this x ray. Only the upper airway, the trachea, and the neck. All right. This, well, what is this, first of all? Lateral. Lateral upper airway. This is done to demonstrate all. Of the following except what? Which one does not fit? C. 
see, that's the only one that doesn't make sense, right? Mm -hmm. Because yes, we're looking for foreign bodies. We're also looking for the air-filled trachea. And we're also, even though we don't know what the word opacified means, Somewhere. we're still looking at the pharynx, right? Yeah. Absence of movement doesn't even make sense. So that's <laughs> the least likely answer. It's, I'm just showing you how to do some test taking strategies here, guys. Opacified, by the way, mean, by the way, means like a solidified, very white looking pharynx on the x-ray. Like there's like a big mass in there that's very white. The absence of movement does not make sense. Uh, we just talked about this. What is the projection, the position, and well, anatomy is not on there, but what are we looking at out of those choices? AP for sure. What y'all think that is? C. Correct. The clavicles are above the apices. Has to be lordotic. What's the only choice that works? The one that says apiaxial lordotic. Apiaxial lordotic chest. All right. Wait, that's the last image we looked at. What is that? We have forgot that already, but. Lateral, lateral dorsal decubitus, because the dorsal surface is down, it's hanging on its side, horizontal central ray, we're looking at fluid levels, lateral dorsal decubitus. Be careful though, because see how tricky that gets? Because mm -hmm. the patient is lateral and supine, but does that fit that correctly? No. That's specifically a lateral dorsal decubitus. What about that one? Right lateral cubis because the right side's down, side. left side's up. What, are, what pathology are we demonstrating in this x ray? The fluid film. Fluid. fluid. But what else can we see sometimes? Air. Free air. What's that, guys? Lateral. lateral. Simple question. Lateral chest. Yes, lateral chest. What about this one right here? Careful. LPO. Uh, a. It's a. A. P. L. P. O. Oblique. So we gotta look at. Think about the side down. What are we marking? We're marking the side down. So we know the left side's down. So that's our first clue. But then we see the left one's also stretched out. And which oblique do we do that stretches out the side down? The LPO. So we do AP oblique, LPO. I'm sorry, yeah, LPO, left lung. AP oblique, LPO, left lung. So we mark the side down, left side's down. And then we're elongating the left lung. The only position that elongates the left lung when it's down is the LPO. Does that make sense? We gotta look at the marker. Which side is being elongated to so identify that x ray? So we get AP oblique, LPO, left one. I got another one here. What would this be? Look at your marker and look at your lung that's elongated. So we know once again, left side's down, but now the left side's foreshortened. We're elongating the opposite lung. So what's that tell us? What position am I in? Right. Left side down, right lungs elongated. So that would be a PA oblique, LAO. 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 And we're looking at the right lung. Does that make sense? So I said make yourself a little chart, guys, of what side's down, what side's marked, and which lung is elongated. So you'll see questions like this on your test. Question? So how do you know that uh, which side is down? By which side is marked. The marker indicates which side is touching the IR. But you also got to know which lung is being elongated to determine if it's an AP oblique or a PA oblique. Wait. Who put the marker that's touching the IR? The side touching the IR is the marker you put down. Yes. Then wouldn't that be a uh, AP? I mean this last one? This one right here? Do you want this one? No, no, no. The previous one? No, go to the next picture. It's the patient's left. Correct. Left, left. left side's down, but as you can see, the opposite side's elongated. That tells me they're in a PA oblique because the side that's oppositely up will be the elongated lung on the PA obliques. 
versus my AP obliques, I'm elongating the side that's down, and I'm also marking the side that's down. So if I see a marker on the same side as the elongated lung, RPO, if I have a left marker with a left elongated lung, LPO, if I have a left marker with the opposite lung elongated, that's an LAO, this would be a right marker, left lung elongated, REO. See that? You're recording, right? Like, yeah. You're recording, right? I'm going to need that. <laughs> Just the marker, right? and super the left one, and it's obvious that, that it's our left, but it's the right side is bigger. So since that side's bigger and it's not the same side as the left side, it's going to be a PA. Correct. Yeah. So that means because your PA obliques elongate the side up, yeah. your posterior obliques or your AP obliques elongate the side down. Yeah. Okay. So I'm telling you guys, make a chart. Make a chart that's going to help you. So this way you can answer these questions. Posterior obliques, the sides that touching the IRAs are the ones that are elongated. And the posterior obliques, the side that's touching, that's not touching the IR, is elongated. Correct. We're going to keep, we'll come back, I'll re-explain at the end of class if you need to. We'll do this again. This is what people have the most trouble with, so I'm not surprised that we're having trouble with that. Okay. See me, I will have to on that one. I put my left marker, and I just I have to visualize it so I know if I'm my left marker on uh, LAO, and then I will know. Okay, I'm looking at my right side. That's how I would have to do it. If I'm just looking at this, I'd be like I'm lost. So I have to. So I'm telling you, if you make go, a chart with yeah. all your obliques, make the positions right. Which marker is down and which lung is elongated. You'll have that as a reference point for all these questions. You can answer every oblique question if you make that little chart. That's why I have to do it in school as well. It's going to help you out. But we'll review this at the end of class if you all need to again. Let's keep moving on. I want to make sure we get to our review stuff. What is this? Where's the marker? <laughs> That's a good point. What did I say? If there's no indications or no markers on there, we're going to Oh, PA. 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 Okay. If there's no indication in the question or the image, you always assume for a PA. If it says AP on there, or if it says AP in the question, you're going to mark it as AP. But only if they indicate it in the question or the image. Otherwise, you assume for a PA. It's a general rule in radiography. All right. That's the end of chapter 30. That's a long chapter. Don't worry, chapter 4 is a lot shorter. <laughs>